This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today inspires readers. No doubt about that. He's the author of 17 books, including five bestsellers. His very first one, The Energy Bus. My guest, John Gordon. I can't think of any cooler way to break into the space that John has broken into and dominated than going down the sports direction. I'm not giving away any hints yet. But this is an inspiring story. Inspiring to see John overcome obstacles, to see John push and strive and make it happen. We can all hope like crazy to look at John's work and say, why not us? Why not me? Why not you? Now, before I get into my conversation with John today, one quick reminder My newest book, Trend Following, How to Make a Fortune in Bull, Bear, and Black Swan Markets, is now available in audiobook. It only took about two months extra time. Don't ask why. These things happen. But it's out now. It's 34 plus hours. Give me a break. You can drive across the country listening to that baby. But enough of my book promotion. And on to my guest today. What a fun conversation I sincerely hope you enjoy the perspective of John Gordon. So, John, listen, back in the day, I had a buddy of mine, and I don't know exactly how he did this, and I think it was for a Florida State-Miami game in Tallahassee. Somehow or another, this guy, knowing how the system worked, He found his way into the pregame speech that Bobby Bowden was giving to the Florida State Seminoles. He's sitting there with the team, the coaches, and Bobby Bowden. And eventually, they just look at the guy and they, who the hell is this guy? Get this guy out of here. You, on the other hand, have figured out a, a more safe way to connect with the college football coaches of America. This is quite the interesting story. And I think we're, where I'd like to really dig into here is, is partly how that's happened. But you've got such a fantastic client, I guess, would be with the head football coach of Clemson. What, a, what an interesting story. And I don't know what the interesting story is, but I know there's something there. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I've been working with teams for years, even before Clemson, I say years, you know, uh, four or five years. I started, my first team was the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2007. Jack Del Rio was the head coach. He read Energy Bus. Mike Smith, who was the defensive coordinator at the time, gave him the book and said, you should have John come and speak. I didn't know Mike Smith, but I had a friend who knew Mike who gave Mike the book. Jack calls up. And I went down to meet with him, very intimidated. I was gonna, this to is, he's Jack. a tough guy, right? I mean, he's. Yeah, I mean, and a big, large mountain <laughs> of a man. I had never spoken to a team before, a high school team, college team. And now here I am meeting with Jack Del Rio. I just wrote the energy bus, thought I had something that could make a difference. And now I'm sitting across from him and he's telling me about how the book really impacted him about the message of positivity and dealing with energy vampires and negative people and so forth. And he said, would you speak to the team? And I boldly said in that moment, I will speak to the team if you have everyone read the book. And he said, you got it. Done. I'll get it for everyone. He wound up getting the book for everyone in the organization, including the janitors, including the food service people. Everyone got a copy of the energy bus. And I went and spoke to the team. I was definitely nervous. I mean, at the time, Fred Taylor was on the team. Maurice Jones-Drew was like a rookie. I mean, these were guys who I loved watching play, guys I supported, saw on TV, and now here I am and speaking in front of them. Completely random. Yeah, just sharing my talk on, you know, the energy bus. I don't think I was even a great speaker then. I definitely wasn't actually, but I was on fire. I got fired up and just started talking about staying positive, dealing with the negativity, don't allow the energy vampires to sabotage or bring you down. It really resonated with it. 
and they had a great season. They went 11-5, and five, made the playoffs for the Jaguars. That was a big deal, and beat the Steelers in the first round. Mike Smith then became the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. He then called me up out of the blue and said, hey, you know, this is Mike Smith. You know, coach of the Falcons. We just met briefly because I think we just shook hands and that was it. He said, I want to do the same thing with the Falcons that you did with the Jaguars. And so I said, sure. So he got the book for everyone, went to speak to the Falcons. Matt Ryan was a rookie that year and Mike Smith was a, a rookie head coach, spoke to the team and then did that every year for seven years while he was a coach until he got fired from the Falcons. But then I worked with the Texas Longhorns in 2009, the year they went to the national championship, spoke to them because a coach had a friend on the team, uh, had, had actually a friend who was an assistant coach. He heard about it, brought me in, then worked with University of Georgia. But then what happened is, you know, coaches started to pass the book along. For some reason, it was a book that resonated with coaches. And then I wrote Training Camp with the best do better than everyone else, which is my favorite book I've written. It's about the winning habits that separate the best from the rest. So different coaches started reading those books. And then I started getting invited to speak to basketball teams, women's basketball teams, lacrosse teams, women lacrosse teams. And it's been crazy. I could never anticipated that I would be doing this, but I do love it. I mean, I spoke to the Dodgers this year, the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Oklahoma City Thunder, the Miami Heat, and teams like that now. So it's really, because uh, it was just football, now I'm getting to speak to a lot of you know NBA and Major League Baseball teams. And you know what's so awesome about it? Not just the content alone, it's the entrepreneurial instinct, smelling it out and, and getting that, you know, taking that first chance and jumping in, not necessarily planning it at all and just going for it and, and not and each one, each iteration that would come along and build on it. That's what's cool about that story. You just nailed it because it was just showing up, doing the work, not worrying about failing, just given everything I had, not knowing if it was going to be good or not, but then get invited back. And sometimes I'm surprised I am invited back, right? But just to do it and then get better and build. Now when I walk in with a team, I know what they need to hear. I know their challenges. And I can see how along this journey I've been prepared for these, you know, these bigger audiences and so forth. Okay, let's let's use a practical example and stay in the sports for right now because you – do have this, and I, I hope I don't say it wrong. It's Dabo Swinney, right? Dabo Sweeney. Yeah, Dabo Sweeney. Sweeney. Okay, it looks like you want to say Swinney, but it's Sweeney. We lose, he loses, his team loses the 2015 National Championship two years ago. They win it this year. You were involved over the course of the loss and the win? Yeah, I was abroad there to speak well, five years ago. So I've been speaking to the team for the past five years. And what happened was Chad Morris read my book, Training Camp. I didn't even know Chad Morris. And he was at Tulsa at the time, hired by Dabo as the offensive coordinator for Clemson. He goes there, gives Dabo the book. This is how weird this stuff happens. Gives him the book. <laughs> Dabo reads it, loves it. He starts sharing one of the 11 traits of what the best do better than everyone else. He's like, Clemson's going to be the best. And every week, he shared one of those characteristics every week with the team for 11 weeks. He was sharing what the best do better. Now, I don't even know he's doing that, but every time I turn on the TV where I live in Florida, the Clemson games seem to be on, the ACC network or whatever. I'm going through the, the channels, and there's Clemson. There's Clemson. I'm watching these guys going, I love these guys. I love this team. Next thing you know... At the end of the season, they had a good season that year. They won 10 games. The year before, they were 6-7, and seven, won 10 games. I get a private message on Twitter from Chad Morris, and he said, Hey, would you ever come speak to the team? We used your book this year. I'm like, no way. I've been watching you guys all the time. I love your team. And I never loved Clemson before in my life. And so I went and spoke to the team 2012, and I've worked with the team ever since. So, yes, I was there in the locker room when they lost the championship, and I saw Dabo give an incredible display of positive leadership because he didn't focus on the loss. He said, guys, I've never been more proud of you, of a group of men than I am tonight. You guys are amazing. I wouldn't want to coach any other team. You seniors, you've left a legacy, but you underclassmen, get ready because we're coming back. And he proceeded to talk for about five to ten minutes about how they were going to come back. They just lost the national championship, and he was already pointing towards the future. I was blown away. I could very easily think, and you're going to have to educate me because I don't know the backstory, that perhaps you were able to give some piece of insight 
that helped after a big loss over the course of the next year coming into where just recently in this, you know, what, five, six months ago where they actually won it. But now if I go that direction, I can also very easily think that even the time they they lost it, they could have won it, it but, but not for a coin flip almost. I mean, it was literally the luck of the draw. I mean, there's, and, and also when they won it, the game was so close. So you, it literally could have been reversed. They could have won the first one and lost the second one. But was there some growth there or was there something you were able to do to help? Tell me your view on it. Yeah, I take full credit for all their success. That's my view. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm co- totally kidding because <laughs> I, I believe the complete opposite. It's funny because like I spoke to Clemson and then I also joke when I speak to audiences because I said, guys, not everyone I talk to wins. I spoke to the Cleveland Browns two years ago. So one thing I've learned about is it's never the talk. It's never the book. It's always the leadership. It's always the leaders on the team, the leadership in the coaching room, how they lead, how they deal with adversity, how they come together as a team. Dabo Sweeney helped this team grow from that loss. He's an amazing, positive leader. I think there's very few things that I said that made a difference. I know training camp, being a part of their program, was helpful. I know that teaching the coaches and team about loving, serving, and caring from the carpenter was very helpful. Dabo talked about that. He talked about his one word for the year. I did that with the team about having your one word and using that word to have more motivation and purpose. But Dabo had them do a vision board, each guy. They also had a lot of leaders after that loss that came back and said, you know what? We want to win another one. So they really had a lot of great leadership and team accountability. And then you have Deshaun Watson, who is the best quarterback in the country, the best gamer and a great winner, making that last drive. If he doesn't do that last drive, they don't win. So you're right. It could have been all these little things. So everyone looks at it after the fact, but it was a lot of combination of a lot of things. But the two biggest components, no doubt, were the visions, the vision that Dabo had, and the leadership and the belief. The belief in the players And then the belief they had each other that, you know what? Yes, they just scored with two minutes left, but we're coming down and we're winning this game. And they just had this incredible faith and belief in that moment. Before I dig into some of the principles and ideals in your newest work, The Power of Positive Leadership, one more football type question, sports team type question. You've given some idea of the coaches and your connection with the coaches, but very often the coaches will know of you first, right? And they will then tell the team, hey, you got to know about this guy, John. I'm sure these are stud athletes. You know, they're, they're probably thinking, oh man, some of them are thinking this, hey, whatever. I want you, if you can, are there, are there any names or any players, I don't care the sport, that you can think of when you walked in the room and perhaps they were a little skeptical and you gave one of those aha moments where they just paused, looked at you, and you you knew you had won over a diehard skeptic. Does anything jump to your mind for any of the players in particular? Well, I mean, I can't really talk about that from a personal mm. standpoint. All I can say is that... Describe a player without a name. <laughs> all, all I can say is that, um, you know, when you speak to Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dodgers and the Miami Heat and the Padres and the Pirates, and you have... Matt Ryan, the superstars, you have to win them over. Yeah, you're right. So regardless of who's in the room, and even if the coach endorses me, there's some credibility because the coach is saying, hey, I brought this guy here. So there's some value there. Chip Kelly even brought me to the the Eagles, and Tim Tebow was there, and Mark Sanchez, and a couple guys were there. And and Tim came over to me afterwards. I knew I wanted Tim over because he invited me to a Bible study afterwards. (laughs) So that was pretty cool. And, And had a great talk with Tim after that. Really enjoyed our, our conversation. A great guy. So maybe that's something that I you know, can point to. But I do know that you have to win them over. You have to provide something of value that's going to make them better. That's going to help them grow. And if you can't, they're going to tune you out. And they're going to tell right away if you're full of it. And they're going to know if you're the real deal or not. So to me, you know, again, I've had guys reach out to me after the fact, text me, have begun conversations. I'm there to encourage them and help them. And those are the kind of things that come from those talks. Not everyone. Some guys might be rolling their eyes. There are always going to be a few probably. But for probably 90% of the guys, you know, buy in. There's maybe 
25% that really buy in and they want to keep in touch with you. And and that's something. And again, I don't charge these guys. It's just some that they'll reach out. I'll reach out, encourage them, and keep a, a dialogue. That's why, again, they're so they're so private that I really can't share who, and I don't want to violate that trust. Let's dig into positive leadership. Now, people might hear that phrase immediately, positive leadership. They might think to themselves, well, come on, you know, all, all leaders are positive. I mean, but that's not the case. And I can think of an example, and I will try not to name names here, but there's a, a big ride-sharing company, and the CEO <laughs> seems to get mixed up in every bad headline in the world. And it doesn't seem very positive to me. But for the audience right now, for those that are hearing of you for the first time, why don't you lay out for us, positive leadership, big picture, macro. Sure, and I'm glad we're moving into this because I don't just work with sports teams. I do work with a lot of companies and you know leaders of Fortune 500 companies. And I, it's funny because I actually do more of that than than sports. Sports are just what people seem to love to talk about. But in terms of um, you know positive leadership, to be a leader, a real and effective leader, you must be a positive leader. We almost shouldn't have to say positive, right? Because you have to be optimistic. If you are a leader, you have to believe in a brighter and better future because that's what leaders do. They point people towards the future. You could be a visionary. Steve Jobs maybe wasn't positive, so to speak, in terms of his relationships, but he was very positive about creating a future that he imagined, that he believed the in, the culture, and also what they called his reality distortion field, that time and time again, he was able to distort the reality of his employees because they said there's no way they can create the software in a certain amount of time, and he would always convince them they could do it faster. And they said time and time again, he distorted their reality from, some would say, pessimism or realism, I'm just being a realist, to optimism. And that's what positive leaders do. So first and foremost, they're, they're very big on vision. They see a brighter and better future. They lead with this optimism and belief that it's possible, right? We can do this. And then they also, though, deal with the negativity that exists. They don't allow negativity to sabotage their team. So that's something I wrote about, again, in this book and create a framework in terms of you got to address negativity. One of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is they don't address negativity. So being a positive leader is not about Pollyanna positive. It's not about thinking we're going to sing Kumbaya and hold hands all the time. So no, we got some real issues. We got some real challenges. We will address them. We will deal with the negativity, but we're going to do so in a positive way. And as we do so in a positive way, we then create a fertile environment now where we weed the negative, feed the positive, create an environment where everyone can do their best work. And then positive leaders do what they really do is they unite the organization. They unite people. They rally people. Alan Mullally, which I wrote about in that great and that is a great example in the book. And then they also connect with individuals. They develop the relationships. So this guy you're talking about, the rideshare company, he's, he's very big on vision, right? Excellent on getting a product to market, but I'm not sure I would describe him as a, a full-blown positive leader in terms of how he really approaches people and things, just as Steve Jobs maybe wasn't the complete positive leader. Positivity, though, is contagious. And, and that might sound to some people hokey or something, but if you have a positive leader at the top who's pushing that positivity nonstop, 24 and 7, it does rewire the circuits of those underneath him, doesn't it? It, it does. And you're right. It is contagious in a positive way. And the research shows us to be true that, that our feelings transmitted by the heart are contagious. So you're broadcasting positive energy or negative energy. We also have research that shows that um, emotions are contagious, emotional contagions. So people are likely to catch your good mood just as they might catch your bad mood. That's important to know as a leader that you are contagious in that way. And so when you come in with this vision and your feelings and your emotions and your beliefs, those are contagious to the people around you. Leadership, I often say, is a transfer of belief. When Dabo Sweeney got the job at Clemson, he walked in the office, walked in the team meeting room, and he brought in two signs. One that said, believe, and I can't, with the T crossed out. And he built that program based on belief. Saw firsthand how contagious it is. And people start to get the mission. They start to get the vision. They start to buy into the belief from that leader. And so you see it all the time in businesses. You see it in companies, in schools. You want to transform a school? 
Everyone's talking about transforming education. Bring in a positive leader as a principal, someone who can really rally the teachers, who gets them involved, gets them bought in to what they're doing, get them involved in the mission of making a difference in kids' lives. You do that one school at a time, bring in a great leader, you're going to transform the school. Let me use Dabo as an example here, just since you mentioned him again. It wasn't that he got the job and walked into the room and everyone automatically followed him. It wasn't because he mandated, you must follow me, I am the hired leader. This positive leadership is, it's the, the people underneath the leader want to, they want to follow. It's not just, you can't command it. You have to become that someone that, you know, the people underneath you want to be like you. They want to be with you. Yeah, I love the way you just said that because it's it's not something you can dictate. The dictatorial leader no longer works today. You have to be someone that they want to follow. And you have to, as Walt Whitman said, convince by your presence. And so through your positive energy, through your belief, you're convincing. Now, let's get something straight here, by the way, though. People are probably thinking, does this mean I have to be an extrovert? No, you can be an introvert, and still be a positive leader. Your energy is still contagious. The love that you have, the passion or the mission that you're driven by internally is what people sense, is what they feel. Your integrity is contagious. So ultimately, who you are is what people are picking up on every day and every moment. So that's what people need to know in terms of this this leadership that truly makes a difference. I liked this phrase that I had never heard before in and the power of positive leadership, which is the caring trademark. And I'm going to paraphrase here, but you describe it as kind of that unique way to show that you care. What is that? What is that something, something? I, I mean, I, I care. I love doing this podcast. I'm at 500 plus episodes. I love writing books. You know, I love doing these things. I don't know exactly what it is or what I put into it, but I think you can if people stop paying attention, they know you don't care. I think if you if you do give it your all, but I, I, I was trying to think of that. I was like, wow, a caring trademark. That's really an interesting concept. Uh, speak to it uh, in your, your, how that came to you and, and perhaps an example that you could uh, help illustrate with the audience. Yeah, I started to think about like every great leader and company does have a caring trademark. If you go to public supermarkets, have you ever been to a Publix? Down in the South, I have. Okay, and if you ask someone who works there, where something is, they're not allowed to just tell you. They have to walk you to the spot on the shelf and show you where it is. They're not allowed to say, aisle nine, good luck, man. They have to take you to the spot. So that's their care and trademark. They're known for that. Les Schwab Tire Centers in Oregon, when you pull up, they actually sprint outside from inside to greet you when you get out of your car at the tire centers. That's their care and trademark. I started to think of Chick-fil-A, which says, my pleasure, not no problem. They say, my pleasure. That's one of their care and trademarks. And so people have them as well. Dabo, for instance, he believes in his players more than they believe in themselves. Clint Hurdle, the coach of the Pirates, the manager of the Pirates, he's a just a guy who just loves his players like family. And they just know it. Some coaches like Mike Smith, he's a great listener. Like that's his care and trademark. He truly listens and his players know that he's always there for them with a listening ear. My care and trademark is encouragement. I love to encourage people. And so I know that anyone who reaches out to me, for instance, needs encouragement. I always respond because I want to encourage people. So that's my care and trademark. Derek Jeter with the Yankees, his last at bat was so special. It was a game-winning hit, right, in Yankee Stadium. But it was so special because he ran to first base every time, whether it was an out or a home run, like it was his last at-bat. Every at-bat he treated like his last. So he showed he cared. Doug Conan, former CEO of Campbell's Soup, he has written over 10,000 thank-you notes to people he's done business with and to his employees of Campbell's Soup at the time. So that was his care and trademark is to write these thank you notes. Amazing. If you don't know what it is, I really believe you can discover it. And I believe your podcast obviously is one of the ways that you show you care. But here's the thing. We could tell when someone cares or not, right? We know right. when they care. They put their heart and soul and spirit and passion into it. I wrote about this in The Carpenter. You know, there's a difference between a carpenter and a craftsman. Carpenter shows up and just builds something. But the craftsman or the craftswoman, they put their heart and soul and spirit and passion into what they're building. Why? Because they care more. 
Now look, anyone listening to you right now can feel the energy. They can feel the passion. And of course, to go in and deal with corporate America and sports teams, you have to give that too. But I think, and I'm not mistaken here, I I don't think I'm mistaken, I've seen you described, maybe this was a self-description, a 31-year-old, fearful, negative, stressed-out guy. (laughs) Is that that accurate? That was then, yeah. Now I'm 46, so that was a while ago. So what was was going on at 31? What was the... what was what what was I mean obviously you're not there now, but it can be helpful for people to see. I mean, you describe yourself fearful, negative, stressed out at age thirty one. What changed for you? What changed was that my wife gave me the ultimatum, like, okay, change or you're off the bus. She really said if you don't leave if you don't if you don't change, I'm leaving. So you better change. And I begged her to stay, agreed to change, and that began my journey. How did you take the first step? The first step was literally a prayer. And I never really prayed before like this. I just said, God, like I reached out and cried out, like, why am I here? I know a lot of people, some people don't believe in God, but I was like, you know what? God, I know you're out there. I am miserable. I'm negative. Why am I here? I know I'm here for a reason. What is it? And I kid you not, writing and speaking came to me in that moment. It was a divine experience. I mean, it wasn't like a lightning strike or anything, but it was just like this came to me and I'm like, okay. And I had to feel like, that's what I'm going to do. That aha moment. Yeah, like, what am I going to write about? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. Ken Blanchard was one of my role models I looked up to. He went to Cornell and taught at Cornell. I went to Cornell. It's funny that he would wind up writing the forward to the energy bus, you know, my first book. I said, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna write and speak. I didn't know what, but I have a friend to this day. He's the CEO of a company, very successful. He remembers me telling him, like, one day, like, around that time, like, I'm going to write and speak. That's what I'm going to do. And he's like, and you went and did it. it. And it was just literally, you know, it wasn't success right away, but I just said, that's what I'm going to do. And I began the step though of more so changing me more than trying to change the world. It started with me having to become a more positive person. That's why that chapter is called from negative to positive, because I had to get out there and become a better me first. So I was like taking walks of gratitude and prayer each day, just saying what I was thankful for, trying to flood my brain and body with positive emotions that uplift me. I started writing different things and you know sharing these tips at the time there wasn't newsletters back then there weren't all these blogs and 2002 i started a positive tip of the week i've done it now for 15 years i write it every week myself and i still do it every day again got to care right got to care more got to continue to do it it, doing the laundry so to speak Uh, yeah i still do the laundry but um i didn't do it then but i do it now to you know i gotta show my wife i care and so i continue to do these like newsletters every week because that's what i did back then and i gotta continue to show that i do it but it was like this step by step of doing the newsletter just starting out there sending it to five people then six people i then started to say hey i'm gonna write and speak i started putting it out there to friends anyone who wants to talk i create a web page that just was like a picture had a news section and it was just like this is what this is what i'm doing now and a friend reached out said hey i have a friend that works for singular wireless this is how long it was would you go speak to her team i did i did like 80 free talks you know 80 free talks just to get started but it really helped me get better and improve as i did it and again i wasn't i never thought i was going to make money from this i was just like you know what i'm going to go do this and live this life that I'm meant to live and go do what I'm meant to do. And if it, if it makes me successful over time, if it leads to great things, then great. If not, we'll see what happens, but I'm just going to go for it. Look, when you, can, when you can find an insight that other people don't know and pass it along, that feeling alone gives an adrenaline burst that you can't turn off. Yeah, as, as a speaker, you know this well, right? When you've made a difference in someone's life, and, and you write as well, so you know, as you've ri- you write and speak and you can impact someone, that is the greatest feeling in the world. People always ask, what's the greatest feeling? It's not winning the lottery. I believe it's knowing that you made a difference. Yeah. Hey, there's a couple bullet point notes that I made here, and I... I don't know. I don't know if you've talked to any kind of uh, Wall Street folks yet, or have gone that direction. But there's there's two two phrases, and they're not necessarily connected. But embrace failure and trust the process. You might be surprised to know that in in great trading, great Wall Street performance, embracing failure, like for example, if a trade goes against you, getting out, taking a loss, is like 
It's like number one and trusting the process, meaning once you have a system or an approach, you have to stick with it regardless of the minor hiccups along the way, the, the quote whipsaws. So I, I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but I see, I see some of the, the statements in your book and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I kind of have written about this in a, in a completely different audience, but embrace failure, trust the process. Give me your feeling. Oh yeah, I mean this is the same kind of principles for success in sports, on the trading floor, investments. You have to trust the process. You have to say, you know what? These are my strengths. These are my principles for success. You cannot lead or succeed based on circumstance, right? You have to lead and succeed based on your principles. This is how we do things. This is how I handle because those principles are your rock when circumstances change. Now it doesn't mean you're not flexible. It's sometimes different circumstances you have to be flexible, but you lead by your principles and your process of how you do things. You know, so the prin- the principal side of things that is what you're talking about. And then what was the other one? The process and it, it embrace embracing failure. Oh, embrace and failure. Yeah. So embrace and failure is the key to any success. Now you don't want to have you know, too many failures, you want to learn from your failures, but it's the idea of a growth mindset that along the way, failure is an event. It's not a definition. You cannot be afraid to fail and succeed at the same time. It's an NBA player going for a shot. If you're worried about missing it, you're going to miss it. You got to be willing to go for it and to truly succeed in trading and investments. You have to be willing, right, to take some risk. It's mitigated risk, but you have to take some risk in order to succeed. I want to go into a topic, something that you brought up early in the podcast, and I, some people might not be familiar with the term. They might be able to deduce pretty quickly, pretty quickly where you're going, but energy vampire. <laughs> give, give, give the definition of the energy vampire from the John Gordon perspective. Well, it's that guy in the locker room or that teacher in the building or that person on the trading floor, that person who works in your office that just sucks the life right out of you. They're just a negative person. They're an energy drain. When you finish a conversation with them, you feel exhausted. That is an energy vampire. And one person can't make a team, but one person can break a team. I was speaking to the University of Georgia football team. Mark Rick brought me in to speak. And after I spoke, they lost the first two games. I thought I ruined them. He had, he had the entire team read the energy bus. And then after they lost those two games, I was like, oh, man. So I sent him a text. I said, Coach, I still believe in you guys. He said, John, the guys are still on the bus. In years past, we've allowed energy vampires to sabotage our team, but not this year. This year, we will not allow it. In their big meeting room, they put a huge picture of an energy vampire on the wall. And any time one of the players was being a vampire, they took their picture from the media guy. They put it on the wall. No one wanted to be on the wall. They went on to win the next 10 games in a row, making it to the SEC championship. That team truly believes that staying positive really helped them. And a team that stays positive together wins together. And guys were going into his office saying, Coach, I'm not going to be a vampire anymore. I've been one, but I'm not going to be one anymore. And you know what? I go to companies. I've worked with some financial companies. You were mentioning that earlier. You know, I have. And you can see the guys. They just roll in their eyes. They think whatever. They don't need this positivity. You know what? They're not into it. And there's always going to be a few vampires. But I believe to create a great culture, you have to address those vampires. To create a great culture, you can't allow one negative person to sabotage your culture or your team. Because if they're bringing everyone else down, that's going to affect performance overall. You see football coaches do it. You see great teams do it. So I'm a big believer in making sure that you address those vampires. Try to transform them. Try to help them get better. Help them improve. If they don't, you got to let them off the bus. That was going to be my question, really, was the practical effect of dealing with an energy vampire there's the attempt to transform, but is there a is there a way where the audience, from all the experience you've seen, is there is there something where people, when you've got an energy vampire and they won't transform, is I mean, or is you know, is each situation is different? But is there is there are there telltale signs that you've got one that's not going to transform, and the only the only solution is to part ways. I think it's going through the process of trying to work with that person, talk to them coach them and see if they're willing to change. See if there's a change of heart. See if they're humble enough to say, you know what, I want to get better. And if they're not, because I mean, there were guys who were now in the NFL who were on that team at Georgia, who literally were transformed by deciding to be positive. And they talk about how it changed their life forever. 
I know three or four of them that I still have great relationships with. So if someone's not willing to change that, Butch Jones came to me at University of Tennessee. He said, John, he spoke to his 10 of them, his vampires. Eight stayed on the bus and two got off. And he knew that those two had to get off. They were unwilling to change. So I believe you go through the process of trying to make a change, trying to impact. If they won't change, then right then and there, you know you got to let them off. So cool, though. We work with this. We have an Energy Bus for Schools program. We are transforming education through this building positive cultures and positive leaders. Started out with five model schools. Now we have 50. We're going on 100. It's unbelievable. The case studies are going to be incredible what's coming out of this. But we had one principal call us, and I have a you know a former principal, and she runs the whole thing, Nikki Spears. And she said, Nikki, she's like, I don't know what to do with this vampire. Like, I, like sh- should I kick them off the bus? And Nikki said, just work through it. Try to transform it and build your culture so strong that they'll get off themselves. She goes, I don't know if that will ever happen. Well, guess what? The end of the year is happening now. That teacher came to that principal and said, you know, I just can't do this energy bus stuff anymore. I'm resigning. Like, I I can't do it anymore. I can't stand it. Like, she couldn't stand the positivity. So she was out and she got off herself. You know what I love too? This one line here that I jotted down, don't be negative about negativity, which kind of treats it like an, an isolated cancer, this is my wording, but don't be negative about the negativity, meaning you can spot it, you can attempt to deal with it, but don't let it affect you. Just let it be something compartmentalized. Am I reading you right? I had to write that in the Power of Positive Leadership because it's been 10 years since the energy bus has been out. Many people are discovering it for the first time, but the people that have used it you know, over the years, some have misused it. So what they do is they say, you're either on my bus or off my bus, and that's their leadership. And it was never meant to be that way. So I have people literally emailing me saying, John, we're reading your book. My boss, that was the biggest energy vampire of all. And they're trying to promote this like it's part of the the plan, part of the program. It's really hard to get those kind of emails because that was never intended to be like that. So I wrote this to say, you know what? You may have negativity, but you don't address it in a negative way. You don't be negative in that way. You have to through great leadership, through relationships, what we talked about earlier, belief and vision and and being positively contagious. Get those people on your bus by the way you lead. If they don't, then you let them off. But don't come in with this negativity thinking it's positive. One last one for you, John. I think it's a it's a really important one for any any personal success, any team success. There's been some books written about it, but I would love for your perspective as well. And that's grit, persistence, grit. I mean, that's it's like the starting point. You've got to have it. You've got to believe. You just got to stick with it no matter what. Yeah, Angela Duckworth, foremost researcher on grit, just wrote a great book called Grit, came out. We had a conversation before her book was coming out, and I told her my thoughts on grit, asked her were they in in you know alignment with her research she said yes so i knew i was on the right track and the key here is that you know as she says grit is the number one predictor and factor of success and every leader to succeed as we know will have to have grit because you're going to face adversity you'll face challenges the energy vampires the naysayers steve jobs was fired Oprah was told she wasn't good enough. Elon Musk went through all the challenges right, that he had to go through to build his companies. Everyone who has this leadership opportunity will overcome challenges on their journey. So it's the grit that continues to push you forward to be successful in the long run. John, why is this perspective that you have, why is this not thrown out to freshmen in high school, freshmen in college? Why do we go these other directions that sometimes seem to be more of the the pretend world and the real world is kept away from from students? It's a it's a long answer, I know, but it's you know, I, I hear you and I'm just like, gosh, this is this should be indoctrination. This is like 101. I appreciate it. That's my hope. I mean, in writing this book, I mean it's only been out for maybe a month now. So I believe that I wrote this book, my mission and passion in writing this book was that it's going to be the standard of what positive leadership is about, not Pollyanna, grounded in reality, based on research, 
and with hope and vision, optimism, and practical, right? Practical ways to lead that this will be what we will teach high school kids, college kids in business school. That's why I combine real business examples, real coaches, real examples, a framework that we can use, create a, you know, an action plan to go with it. And, and now I'm working on an assessment that a leader could actually take to see where they stand. And then a 360 assessment where a pot, where a leader will give to their team and say, how am I doing? Am I really a positive leader like I think I am? Because we get all these leaders that think they're positive and they're not. And I also want a team to be able to say to their leader, hey, can we do this assessment with you? And see if the leader will be okay with that. So I want to transform leadership and get all those horrible leaders that are really destroying cultures, ruining their teams, leading the wrong way. I want to, I want to transform those people to be more positive leaders because if they can lead better, we will have much better people, much better offices, much better buildings, companies, and really I believe it will change the world in the long run. John, you're infectious. Good stuff. The new book, The Power of Positive Leadership, How and Why Positive Leaders Transform Teams and Organizations and Change the World. John Gordon. John, I appreciate you taking some time today. Great insight. Sounds like a really fun life you've developed. I'm, I'm quite envious. I love the sports connection. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. No, I've had a I've had a blast, and it's it's been a lot of fun, a lot of grit, and a lot of adversity, and a lot of pain along the way. But I am enjoying it now. Where's the best website we can send people to, John? It's uh, johngordon.com, J O N Gordon.com, and Twitter at J O N Gordon Eleven. John, I appreciate your time today. Mike, thanks so much. You're awesome. I really appreciate it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.